brother. I know what you're thinking. Uh, Bjorn has finally gone bonkers. <laughs> He's finally gone completely insane. Um, <laughs> no, uh, actually this is an unboxing video, or it was supposed to be an unboxing video. But I got eager and I opened all the boxes. But anyway, <clears throat> I'll um, take this mask off and I will... Uh, I'll explain. <clears throat> Hi there. <laughs> okay, okay. Hold on. <sighs> yeah, so here I am in a hazmat suit. And you may ask why? Why am I in a hazmat suit? Well, um, because, <laughs> maybe because I, I've, I've finally gone bonkers or crazy. Uh, but also maybe because it's one of those things that you really don't need it until you suddenly need it. And then you need it a lot, if that made any sense. Um, one of my childhood memories was the Chernobyl accident. Uh, I remember we were uh, sitting in the living room watching the news uh, and the updates on where that toxic cloud was moving. Uh, now, I live in Norway, if you didn't know, and um, um, as far as I remember, it was bec only because of uh, the, the wind directions and so on that uh, we did not get uh, a lot more toxic um, uh, waste and, and uh, in Norway. Uh, but since then, I've um, I've always thought that it would be uh, sensible to have uh, the kit you need to survive such a uh, scenario and other scenarios as well uh, for yourself and for your family and here i am uh, i finally finally uh, went and bought what i need to to get through something like that and before i continue with this video uh, i want to point out that i am in no way any expert on uh, on this issue on 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 how to protect yourself from uh, toxic waste and so on. Um, I'm just simply someone who thought it would be sensible to buy the stuff you need for such a scenario. And I will. Um, I was going to do an unboxing video, but I, I got you know I opened all the boxes, and um, uh, so here I am, and I will show you what I bought for myself and my my family. And uh, I will include in this video uh, a conversation I had with uh, actually the guy who's, um, who, who's, who sold me this stuff. <laughs> uh, but it's not, I, I'm not talking with him to sell you his uh, products. It's simply an informative conversation. Um, there are different brands out there that are aimed at uh, civilians and uh, will uh, they will help you with information and uh, guides and so on on how to use this uh, equipment now so let me first start with this gas mask if you didn't know um, this will not I've been told that this will not work when you have a bed like like I have so with this equipment you should put a um, something to get rid of your beard with like quickly and I with this long hair I will actually cut my hair as well um, so this gas mask here uh, has no canister right now I will show you it's it should fit your face well really well uh, if you have used a scuba diving mask you know what I'm talking about it should really it should fit your face really well and you will need a um, canister and there are different 
different kinds of these, of course. Uh, I will not open it because then it will expire quite uh, quickly, I believe. But it attaches, of course, to the to the mask. And there are different kinds of these. So you should. What I've done is I bought several of those. Uh, quite a lot, actually. Um, a flask that attaches to your your uh, your mask. Um, it is better to have a system with a uh, longer tube, so it's permanently uh, attached, of course. And also, <clears throat> um, yeah, the gloves. You already saw the gloves. Uh, the lining for the gloves. Um, you will need boots. I'm sorry about all the sound here uh, from the plastic. And these boots are not for running. <laughs> they go around your other boots, right? Okay. And very important, you need chem tape because all the ceilings must be taped shut, right? They must be taped because otherwise you will not be protected. Uh, this suit, I'll stand up. Um, it's not... Um, it, <laughs> it's, 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 it's not fashionable, right? <laughs> but... Um, yeah, that's what you need. And also, um, hold on, I got a uh, meter. Um, it's a dosimeter uh, to tell you when there is radi radiation. Now, again, I am not an expert on this, just merely a uh, civilian who thought it would be sensible to have this kind of equipment for myself and my family. Uh, I do know that um, some people they buy only the gas mask because there are scenarios where uh, here I go. I, I, I promised myself I wouldn't go there because I might say something that is not correct and I really don't want that. I'm more you know a woodsman, bushcrafter and so on and uh, this is uh, something I am just now getting into. Um, so what I will do is I will go from this <laughs> directly uh, to my, my chat with uh, Mira Safety. And um, they are, I mean, good people. You can, you can send them an email, even if, not, if, even if you are not planning to buy uh, I think you can just have a chat and, and you know, uh, they will give you some advice. Lots of um, resources also on their website. And of course, if you are in the market uh, to buy stuff like this, then uh, that's the company I chose. Um, so, okay, uh, let's go to, um, let's go straight from here to the chat. Okay. And... Uh, Thanks for watching. Okay, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we have uh, Roman from Mira Safety here. And I am very curious to ask you about safety equipment for certain disaster scenarios, right? Uh, that's what we're thinking about as preppers and so on. And uh, yeah. I want to take you back to one of my well, maybe not one of my earliest memories, but certainly a, um, a, a, a childhood memory. It's, it's a long time ago. That's what I'm, what I'm trying to, mm. to say. Uh, the 26th of April, 1986. I remember that day because that was the day of the Chernobyl disaster. And we were watching TV from Norway and we were all wondering is this toxic cloud coming to Norway? I and I, I I've never forgotten that day, and um, 
that's one of the reasons that I figured, okay, I need to have some something to protect myself and my family if something like that should happen again. So I bought some stuff. I bought one of your gas masks, but the, my problem is I know nothing about this. I know nothing about this stuff at all. So hopefully you can explain a little bit and, and, and give some advice. Um, so uh, to anyone out there who wants to get you know the the essentials for uh protection against uh, that kind of disaster and other disaster scenarios as well where do you start sure well well first off thank you for having me on your show uh really glad to be here and um you know it's funny that you mentioned chernobyl because uh that's actually one of the reasons i started near safety um i was a small child when it happened and uh, I was born in Moscow, Russia. And thankfully, the plume did not really go over Moscow uh, as much as it did Belarus, Ukraine, and you know even parts of Europe. Um, but it was always discussed in family circles, what could have been done to prepare, uh, what we could have done to mitigate the situation. And you know, that always kind of stuck with me in the back of my mind, like, hey, you know, this incident happened, there are nuclear reactors all over the world. And, you know, we, we like to think positively that nothing bad will happen um but you know I'm, I'm kind of a follower of murphy's law anything that can happen will happen uh so you know it's it's, it's interesting that you mention that because um you know that's one of the reasons i started mirror safety uh so as far as gas masks go um so there's there's a bunch of considerations um one of the main considerations is the size of your face right uh, the, it's very important to have a good tight seal on your mm. mask, and that also includes if you have a beard. Yeah, right? you cannot... what about my beard? <laughs> <laughs> so it's a beautiful beard. Thank you. Uh, how, however, um, beards and masks don't mix. So what we suggest to our bearded customers is to keep a beard trimmer in their kit, and mm. you know it will slow you down, right? Um, it will take some time to get it off. I mean, with a little bit of training, I'm sure you can get it off in two minutes or so. It will slow you down, but it's better than nothing, right? Mm. Uh, because the only other alternative to having a beard and wearing a mask is using a hood type of system that seals around your neck and is under positive pressure through what's called a PAPR a powered air purifying respirator. Mm. So basically, you know, around the neck, you're not going to get as good a seal as you would around the face, um, you know, so long as you're clean shaven. Uh, however, um, it, it, considering it's under constant pressure, it's always forcing air out and not allowing contaminants to come in. Yeah, well, so, I, uh, yeah, I, I love my beard, but I would actually shave off my beard if I knew that I could die from keeping the bit so okay yeah yeah so so i guess the trick is to know when an emergency is happening and when it's important to shave right yeah. so if you hear of let's say another possible nuclear meltdown scenario happening anywhere in europe or in russia um you know and, and it looks like it's serious and not just a small event then you're probably going to want to shave right away just yeah. in preparation for mm. a possible you know, plume coming up into the air and then traveling, um, you know, possibly into your area. Yeah. So, you know, just, just staying vigilant, really. Uh, but also, um, there is not only, you know, the nuclear disaster scenario there, there is also other uh, things that could happen. Like you know, we had uh, a, a factory making i can't remember what they're making the, over there but it, it blew up basically uh, a few years ago uh that could have been much more serious and also i'm thinking uh, what if you want to get past someone trying to control where you are people where you are with tear gas and so on um, then a gas mask could i guess come in handy right and and you know um you mentioned uh, tear gas being deployed. At times, it's not just evacuating where you're affected by it. Um, we've had customers in Hong Kong who are just, you know, innocent bystanders, pretty much living in their high rises, 
and mm. down below them there was civil unrest. Oh. So what ends up happening is uh, the tear gas gets deployed, makes its way into the vent system through the ventilation, and travels up into the entire building. And oh. people are literally sitting in their apartments getting gas. Meanwhile, they have nothing to do with you know, the, the unrest going down below, just being an innocent bystander in that situation. We've had a lot of cases where you know, you're in a major city, civil unrest breaks out. You turn down the wrong street. You didn't know that there was some kind of you know, uh, uh, disturbance going on there. And you know, within, within minutes, your car could potentially be engulfed in tear gas as mm-hmm. it gets deployed and the r- crowd rushes towards you. So, you know, there, there's many practical applications to having a respirator uh, that don't include, you know, a, a straight up sea burn attack uh, or a nuclear reactor meltdown. There's industrial accidents, there's civil unrest, um, and, and there's, you know, practical things around your home. You know, if you're sanding drywall or yeah. uh, it, it's a kind of multi-use product that you can use for so many things. Exactly. Uh, and also, of course, um now I, I'm, I'm quite impressed by your your line of products that that you're selling on Mira Safety. So I chose your brand, and um, so this, you have the suits and uh, gloves, uh, everything to basically seal off everything, so that you're totally protected. Because in some cases you 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 will have to use a suit as well, right? You will. And uh, when donning full PPE, there's also some considerations to be made, right? Um, within professional circles, they have access to equipment that requires a lot of training. And it's also very expensive, like SCBA systems, which are self-contained breathing apparatuses and hazmat suits, which are breathable as well as protective. You know, those kind of hazmat suits could be thousands of dollars. Yeah. Um, so what we try to do is give a practical approach to preparedness so that, you know, basically anybody could save up money and, and buy, you know, this, this kind of equipment. Um, you know, and, and the reason I mentioned that professional, uh, you know, this higher end stuff is there are there are some limitations to this equipment. Right. And uh, there are some considerations. So uh, let's say it's it's hot outside and you're putting on an impermeable hazmat suit okay there's different types of hazmat suits there's permeable and then there's impermeable impermeable is basically the hazmat suit keeping everything out including airflow Mm. so it will get hot in a suit like that and the suits you have are impermeable they're literally meant to just keep the world out yeah Uh, good thing your climate is pretty cool for the most part and not too hot Mm. um so the other option is a permeable hazmat suit which has a carbon lining and it is breathable, right? Yeah. So you will get more use time out of it. However, you cannot reuse it for a long period of time because once you open it, it's the same thing as opening a filter. Yeah. And a filter is constantly you know, absorbing, if it's open, the contaminants in the air. Even if you think that there are no contaminants in the air, there are, and yeah. they're constantly just binding to the uh, activated carbon inside of the filter. Hmm. Um, so, you know, it's important to know the equipment, train with the equipment and know the limitations of the equipment, right? For, for safety purposes, know when, how long you should be in the equipment, how long you can use it for, right? A gas mask and all this, uh, you know, PPE kit is really meant for emergency evacuation purposes for the average person, unless you're a trained professional, you know exactly how much time you have, you know exactly how much time you have in the filter based on readings on your machines that show you what the concentrations of the contaminants are, what the atmospheric conditions are, et cetera. You know, these are very technical products uh, really intended for professional use. However, um, you know, I'm a, I'm a firm believer that anything that the professional market should have, I think the civilian market should have as well. Yeah. And, you know, I kind of leave it to the civilian to educate themselves on proper use of that equipment. But, you know, kind of keeping it behind, you know, a, a glass wall where you could look at it but can't buy it, that's that's not good, right? It's mm. like you want to be able to procure the same type of safety equipment that professionals and, you know, military circles, police, et cetera, use. 
Yeah. Well, when I when I started, and I I I want to mention this as well. Uh, when I started looking into what kind of gas masks that I could uh, uh, buy, I came across lots of I think secondhand military gas masks from different parts of the world. Uh, I, I luckily also read on some forums that don't buy those because basically they won't help you uh, at all, uh, some of them, and you don't know what you're getting. Um, so uh, is there, uh, where, <laughs> apart from your website, of course, wh where should people start looking uh, if they want to get proper equipment um, that will actually help them and be safe for them. Sure. So there's a lot of safety distributors out there. Um, you know, a lot of people interested in preparedness do go the surplus route. And uh, there's there's a few things to consider there because I know how, you know, these markets work. So the way the surplus market works is an agency, government agency, stocks tens of thousands of masks, right? And then at a certain point, certain masks get retired because uh, they are already worn or they've been sitting on the shelf so long that, you know, they're already expired. So at that point, they basically pile them up in a warehouse all together. Um, and then they sit there in this you know warehouse space for God knows how long. Um, and then they sell it at auction to uh, different distributors which then end up in surplus, you know, military surplus stores, end up on the internet, et cetera. So, you know, everybody, you know, a lot of people ask, okay, well, this mask has a 20 year shelf life. So what happens at 20 years in one day? Is the mask bad? No, it's not, it's not bad. That's not really the way it works. Uh, the reason that there are uh, shelf lives on these products is because most of them are made out of rubber and materials that degrade over time. You know, if you've ever used a slingshot, let's say, and you haven't shot it for two or three years and it just kind of sits in the back of your closet and then you pick it up to shoot it, what's going to happen? The rubber band's going to snap, right? Why does the rubber band snap? That's because it's degrading over time. You don't know what process is going on, but it is degrading. So the same thing happens with all rubbers, pretty much. Micro cracks can form, other things can happen. Um, and when it comes to a life-saving device that you're going to rely on during yeah. a true emergency, you want to make sure that you're getting something that's in date and that, you know, you're you're lowering the chances of failure as much as possible. Right. Exactly. Um, exactly. Yeah. So so um, we recommend going to distributors, doing your research and, and kind of uh, uh, sticking to brands that either have European compliance. Right. So uh, in Europe, uh, they have uh, certain standards that respirators must meet in order for anybody to use them. Our masks are European compliant. Uh, it's basically the European equivalent to NIOSH. Uh, in the United States, it is NIOSH, and that is uh, the US standard, which is slightly different, but very similar in many respects. Um, and you really wanna stick to either those two. Uh, certain government agencies have their own standards. Okay, so let's say in Russia, there's the GOS standard. Uh, GOS standard is actually very good as well. Um, it's very similar to the CE standard, which is uh, used in Europe. Um, yep. And uh, you, you just want to make sure that there is testing. Only, you know, some products don't have testing and they only have internal testing because there is no standard for these products. So, for example, uh, children's masks. There are no international standards for children's respirators. So much of the testing that's done on these rep respirators is done in-house or through third-party laboratories that are not evaluated by government agencies because they just don't, you know, they don't, they, they, they don't do products like that. They mm. stick to adult respirators for professional use. They don't really concentrate on children's products, and it's, you know, it's not good that there are no standards. Because yeah. There should be Absolutely. because, you know, what's more important than our children in case something really happens? Yeah, exactly. Uh, and, and it just baffles mm. me, you know, that. Uh, certain countries aren't really taking, you know, drastic steps to make sure the child population is prepared during an emergency. Mm. You know, like, you, you know, you mentioned uh, uh, Chernobyl earlier. Uh, the Russian government did have a healthy supply of gas masks for children, and they had them at the Chernobyl site, not because they thought 
that there would be a nuclear meltdown. It's because that that was a target for uh, international countries to, uh, you know, take out the power grid of Russia. Hmm. So, you know, they all were prepared. They had gas masks. Um, there's there's very few towns within the United States that carry, you know, children's product in case an emergency happens to distribute to the population. So considering this, it's up to the average citizen to make sure that they're prepared, their families are prepared, and that they're not, you know, relying on the government to come help them in case of an emergency. Exactly. And uh, when we spoke earlier, you mentioned that you are planning to also um, provide uh, a sort of cages for pets that will yes that you can put mm -hmm. your dog or cat and so on in the cage and it will um, work as a uh, well maybe you can explain a little bit about that sure so so it's a new product we have coming out uh, it's going to be a plastic fold up accordion style cage you unfold it it's going to be a dome of sorts within it it's going to be astroturf and you can connect it to a papper system uh, any papper system that's 40 millimeter uh, NATO threaded and it com uh, constantly supplies, uh, you know, filtered air into this unit so that you can evacuate with your pets. Hmm. Yeah, well, I can't imagine anything more demoralizing than um, watching your, 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 your dogs die. In, that, would, that must be terrible. You know, so uh, oh, <laughs> I'm yeah. looking forward. I, I'm 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 going to need two of those. Uh, <laughs> uh, but we're going to keep this short. Uh, you know how YouTube works and all that. And um, mm -hmm. uh, so we're going to wrap this up now. But uh, I want to um, also want to say that there are lots of resources on your website. Uh, lots of things to learn, read and learn. And um, so. I'll put uh, the link in the video description. Um, what else is there? Well, <laughs> a lot, I guess. Um, I mean, this is this is a very deep subject. Yeah, yeah. It gets very technical. You know, choices of filters, how to decontaminate. You know, lots of lots of uh, frequently asked questions. How long does a filter work for? Is another mm. question. Can I use glasses? How does it work with smoke? I mean, this is this is a very deep subject, but uh, in, in respect for your your audience's time, I guess we'll keep this short and perhaps we can uh, uh, go through some of these other points uh, in another video. Absolutely. Uh, yes. I, what I wanted to say was that um, there will be people watching this and they will say, "Well, those crazy people, those crazy people, they, they think the world is going to end and so on and so on. Um, now, to those people, I would like to say that, well, it doesn't harm anyone if I have these uh, for my family and myself. Um, I could even actually help someone um, who has, ha hasn't got any of these. Um, in case of emergency, we have like, we pay money for insurance and so on. Uh, so. I, I always get some people who write stuff like that, uh, but um, I guess it's up to each and everyone to decide if you want to be prepared or not. Um, I don't think the world and is I, going to end the tomorrow. The number of people <laughs> who think that way is going mm. down, actually. Yeah. Because as we've seen throughout 2020, there have been many incidents in, mm. where, in which preparedness equipment has helped save people's lives. Yeah. You know, just just uh, earlier this year, St. Vincent in the Caribbean had a volcanic eruption hmm. and the people there were, were choking on, on this volcanic ash and the smoke and the gases released. And we actually sent quite a few masks over there uh, for humanitarian purposes. And, uh, you know, you just you just don't know what could happen. Industrial accidents, natural exactly. disasters, hmm. wildfires. You know, um, mm. people in California every single year go through this cycle of things burning and mm. air quality going down and, you know, and, and in some cases evacuating their homes, becoming almost like refugees, you know, within within a day's yeah. notice or even a few hours notice that they have to leave their home, everything they've built behind 
just take the immediate essentials and get out as the fire approaches their property, you know, their dwelling. Yep. So, you know, these threats are very real. They, they are. Happen. They are. Yeah. And, you know, just keeping your head in the sand and pretending like, you know, uh, everything is, you know, just dandy in the world is, isn't really a smart move. As you said, it's uh, another form of insurance. Yep. Preparedness is another form of insurance. It you is. Know, and, yeah. and it's and it's I consider it right now insurance. Right. If something were to happen right now, mm. are you insured? You know, the insurance company, you call them and they deal with it later and send you money. Mm. Right. <laughs> But this is right now. How, how are you going to save your butt if something happens right now? Exactly, exactly. And uh, I'm sure that most people watching this uh, will agree uh, because it is as as you said there that uh, my impression as well is that more and more people are starting to realize and to, to understand that the world is. Um, it could be it's potentially dangerous and things can happen and things tend to happen as well when you don't expect them to happen and so on um, and we've been through and we are in the middle of a crazy insane time in world history that's my opinion and um, i think people more not everyone but more and more people are waking up um but uh with yeah, um, keeping it short and all that. I know. Uh, uh, again, I know how how YouTube works. And, um, <laughs> <laughs> I want to thank you for your time, for taking the time to to have this chat with me, and uh, also thank you for all the all the resources on your website. Uh, I am a much wiser man now uh, because <laughs> when I started out, I knew nothing about this. These uh, items here so thank you for that and thank you for the time taking the time Th thank you for your time bjorn and uh you know thank you for checking out our website and thank you for the uh, kind words about our content we really try hard to educate the public to make sure that they're well aware you know before getting into purchasing equipment like this that they're well aware of what they should be considering and uh and all that so thank yeah. you Okay, have a nice day. You too. Take care. Bye-bye.